Good evening. Good evening. I want to ask you to take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. Uh, it's certainly great, uh, just wonderful to be back here at Cottondale with you all. And um, I remember when me and Jennifer were dating and I, and I loved coming here with her and uh, hearing Brother Jack preach. And um, so it's always great to be back here. So. Go ahead and take your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 20. We're going to read um, a parable tonight, and this is a very interesting parable. And to be honest, I was talking to, to Brother Jack a while ago, and I was telling him, I have never read this parable up until a couple of weeks ago. It was my first time ever reading the parable before. And it brought me into a lot of confusion with <laughs> just the story in itself. And so we're going to read it together. We'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll jump into the text and see what God's Word is communicating to us tonight. So. Matthew chapter 20 starts off and Jesus says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the workers on one denarius for the day, he sent them into his vineyard. And when he went out about nine in the morning, he saw others standing at the marketplace doing nothing. To those men he said, You also go to my vineyard and I will give you whatever is right. So off they went. About noon and at three, he went out again and did the same thing. And then about five, he went and found others standing around and said to them, Why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one hired us, they said to him. You also go to my vineyard, he told them. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard told his foreman, Call the workers and give them their pay, starting with the last and ending with the first. When those who were hired about five came, they each received one denarius. So when the first ones came, they assumed that they would get more, but they also received a denarius each. And when they received it, they began to complain to the landowner. These last men put in one hour, and you made them equal to us who bore the burden of the day and the burden of in the burning heat. And he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me on a denarius? Take what's yours and go. I want to give this last man the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my business? Are you jealous because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first last. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, I ask you that you would be our teacher tonight. Um, God, I pray that as we jump into the text and we seek to understand the words that you're communicating to us, I pray that we would be attentive, that we would have open hearts, willing to receive whatever it is that you want to lay on our hearts. Lord, I pray that it's not my words, but yours, Lord, that would minister to us tonight through your Holy Spirit. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Most of the parables that Jesus taught to the Jewish audience were very confusing um, and difficult for them to understand. We have the benefit of having Scripture in its entirety, meaning we can look at Scripture as a whole and we can interpret parables and we can see the teachings of Jesus by knowing the rest of the teachings of Jesus altogether. Most parables are difficult for the original Jewish audience to understand, but are actually quite easy for us when, it, when we look into Scripture. This is not one of those parables. <laughs> this is actually a difficult parable to understand. And like I said, when I first read it, um, I came into confusion and almost wanted to side with the man who was hired first thing in the morning. There's only two possible outcomes in my opinion. Either the people who were hired first should be paid 12 denarius, or the men who were hired last should get paid a twelfth. But instead, God is trying to teach this Jewish audience something a little bit different in that they all get paid the exact same thing. Um, for us to understand this in our context, it's very difficult. So let's look at the original audience and the original context of the people, the Jewish audience, and let's look at the culture and see if we can understand the way that they would understand this parable. Well, first of all, we have this owner, this landowner, this master of the vineyard. 
Um, and vineyards were actually very typical to the Jewish culture. In fact, a vineyard was the biggest source of agricultural income for the people at the time. And so we see a picture of this massive vineyard, and most likely it's harvest season. And the master of the vineyard needs more workers than what he would normally have to be able to come and do the harvest. Well, there's normal everyday workers who probably work for this vineyard all year round. They're pruning, they're cutting back vines, they are treating the vineyard in all sorts of different ways. But there's one time of the year where there's a little bit of extra workers that are needed, and it is a season of harvest. And it's where the vines are plentiful with grapes, and it's a time where extra people are needed for the job. So we see these common everyday workers who would go out every day in this vineyard, but the workers in this parable are a little bit different. In fact, the workers of, uh, that we see in this parable are workers who stand out in the marketplace looking for work for the day. Um, it would almost be like you standing on a street corner begging for work to be able to have enough money to feed your family for the next day. They were men who, at, who were at the bottom of the financial scale. They were men who really didn't have anything but only what they needed to survive. They were men who were not the jack of all trades. In fact, they probably didn't work masters in a trade of any kind, but they would do whatever they could in order to work a little bit um, just to make enough money to maybe provide for their family, maybe buy a loaf of bread, maybe just give enough. And so the work day was a little bit different than how we would work. Um, the Jewish culture worked from sunup to sundown. So they work from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Imagine a job where you had to get up, be at work at 6 a.m., and you wouldn't have to leave until 6 p.m. Now, some of you have probably maybe have had jobs like that in the past, or maybe even have one now, I'm not sure. But um, I know for me, it would be very draining to work for, a, for 12 hours every single day. Um, that would be a long work week, and I would get paid a lot of overtime, which would be nice. But... This, this is the, the, the normal culture. They would work 12-hour days. And during this 12-hour day, it was split up, in, split up into segments of three hours. So let me explain this. So the, the people would work from 6 to 9, from 9 to 12, from 12 to 3, and from 3 to 6. And so they had the, this, this working day where they would work for a 12-hour day, um, days long. So when they go to get paid... Normally, they would get paid a denarius for a day's work. And a denarius just simply means it was what they earned for the day. Um, now, I'm not sure how that uh, translates to, to the currency that we have. Um, maybe some of you might have a footnote in your Bible that says this is maybe how much that this would be in our type of currency. Um, but I'm not sure. But really, it's not important. Really, what's important is the fact that at the end of the story, there's really an odd twist that occurs. And so here's the picture that we're seeing, and we see the master of this vineyard, and he goes out to hire workers for the harvest. He goes out at 6 a.m., and he sees a group of people standing, and he says, hey, are, are any of you looking for work? Because I need workers to come out to my harvest. And the men say, well, we're, we're, we'll, we'll work. We're here to work. H hire us. Put us to work. And he says, okay, well, I'll pay you a denarius for the day. And so the men go out to the harvest, and they begin to work in the vineyard. Well, apparently at some point of the day, the master says, well, maybe I don't have enough workers that I need for the day. So he goes back out to the marketplace to look for more workers. He does this at 9 o'clock. He does this at 12 o'clock. He does this at 3 o'clock. And this is all kind of unusual. It doesn't really make sense for this master to, to keep going back out to the marketplace but what's really unusual and probably the biggest thing that, that I think is just really odd about the story is that the owner of the vineyard goes back out to the marketplace at 5 p.m. And at 5 p.m., everyone's getting ready to call it a day. They've only got one hour left of the working day. But he goes out and he goes to the marketplace and he sees men who are standing idly doing nothing. And he says, men, why, why are you standing here idly? And the men said, well, no one has hired us. And so the master says, well, I'll hire you. Go to my vineyard, and, I, and I'll put you to work. 
So after they work, at 6 o'clock p.m., everybody's lining up to get their pay. Well, the ones who come up to the front of the line, who are the, one, the ones who were hired last, they get paid a denarius. Now, that's kind of odd. Now, how much do you think that they should be paid? <laughs> Probably a twelfth of a denarius, right? They only work one out of the 12-hour day. But they get, they get paid a full denarius. Well, what's really odd is that the men who are hired first in the day, who have worked a full 12 hours, they also come up to the front of the line. And this is so odd. Expecting to get paid more, probably 12. If these last men were getting paid one denarius an hour, and they work 12 hours, then how much do you think they should get paid? Probably 12 denarius, right? But they didn't. They got paid the same thing. And notice the profound statement that the master of the own your, the master of the vineyard makes in verse 13 after the men begin to grumble and argue. He said to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me on a full denarius? Take what's yours and go. I want to give this last man the same as I gave to you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my business? Are you jealous because I am generous? Well, with parables, there's usually a, a bigger part of the story. And this isn't, you know, simply a, a children's story, because if it were, it really wouldn't make sense to a children to children because it really doesn't make sense to us when we think about it. But there's a deeper meaning behind this parable. And I really like what John MacArthur um, said when he began to look at this parable and, and he wrote a commentary on it. And there's uh, usually with parables, there's different characters that are represented with each part of the parable. So clearly, the master of the vineyard is probably who? Probably is God. Is the master of the vineyard is, is God. Now, the laborers who God hired to go out, or the master hired to go out into his vineyard, are men who eventually become believers. Um, now, receiving a denarius at the end of their day would be receiving the end result of their life, uh, the glory of heaven. Um, and also we see a picture of a foreman or a steward here who gives them the payment. And John MacArthur would say that that, that would be Christ. And so we see this, this picture, there's a deeper meaning of the parable. And so what I wanted to do tonight is I wanted to look at four things that this parable teaches us about God. Four, four things that I think that this parable is communicating about the character of God and who God is. And the first thing is this. God's generosity of salvation. God's generosity of salvation. Um, I want you to take a notice of how generous this master is. First of all, he didn't approach the men who were already working for him. He approached men who were standing out in the marketplace looking for work. And generously, the master goes up and he says, I need you to work if, if you're ready. I'll pay you. And so he sends the men out into the vineyard. Now, I just want you to take note of, of how generous this God is in that at the very end of the story, he gives the men who have worked one hour for the day a full denarius for the, for the whole day's work. So this is, this is a picture of a very generous master of the vineyard. But I also wanted to, to take note about how from start to finish, it is the master's work. Because the master is the one who goes out to the marketplace. The master is the one who pursues the men who are looking for work. And the master is the one who from start to finish sends them into the vineyard, brings them back, gives them their payment. And from start to finish, it is the master. He is the one who from start to finish. And this is the same thing about God's character in Scripture. Ever since the fall of man in Genesis 3.15, God is is giving a curse to the serpent. And he says that I will make enmity between your offspring, which would be death, and the woman's offspring, which would later be Christ. From the very fall of man, God has initiated this plan of salvation, this plan of redemption that we see all throughout Scripture. And he tells Abraham, and you all the nations of the world shall be blessed. And he gives him this, and later on, Abraham and his offspring, his descendants, the Jewish descendants, out of that would come a Jewish man who was born, who would become the Messiah, the Savior of the world. 
So it is God working from start to finish. All of this is a plan of His, of His working. Um, he is the one who seeks and saves those who are lost in Luke 19, 10. Uh, Jesus says that every person who believes has been first sought out by the Father and given to the Son in John 6, 39. And in John 6, 44, Jesus says that no one comes to the Father unless I draw him. And so we see this picture of God all throughout Scripture and in this parable is that He is the one who is pursuing the men to work. He is the one who calls them, sends them out into the vineyard. He's the one that brings them back and pays them. This story is not about man. This story is about the grace and the mercy of God. And the gracious master of the vineyard is the God that we worship. It's the God that we come here every Sunday morning and every Wednesday night to talk about, to sing, to sing about. It is God and His generosity giving people salvation ever since the fall of man. We see this picture all throughout Scripture. But not only is God generous in His salvation, and this has to mean only one thing, man has no excuse to grumble and complain like the, the first man who was hired. Man has no excuse to do it because honestly, the master never had to hire the men in the first place. He never had to. But out of his love and his choosing, he goes and he calls the men. And it's his choice. Now, this is something that is, it, 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 man, we have no excuse to grumble and complain because our God is a generous God. Okay? So not only does this parable teach us that God is generous, but it, it all also teaches us, this is beautiful, that God is persistent in his pursuit of man. Notice how the master didn't go at 6 a.m., call the man, and not call anybody else for the rest of the day. He goes at 9 o'clock, at 12 o'clock, at 3 o'clock, and at 5 p.m., calling men to come help him in his vineyard. This God is a persistent God. He is relentlessly pursuing those who he loves, us. He is pursuing men to call them out of darkness and into marvelous light. He's pursuing men to call them out of the marketplace and bring them into the vineyard. He's pursuing men to call them out of the kingdom of this world and to bring them to the kingdom of heaven. This is our God. And He's a wonderful God. He's persistent and He's consistent in His working. He never stops. And God redeems everyone who is willing to work. Amen? God redeems the people. And notice how at every single hour He comes out searching for the men to work. 2 Peter 3.9 says that he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But also under this heading, under God's persistence, I wanted us to look at God's compassion. He comes out, the master of the vineyard comes out at 5 p.m., one hour left of the working day. No person has hired this group of men over here. They are still standing, waiting. God has compassion and pity. The master of the vineyard has compassion and pity and calls them and says, you can work in my vineyard. How beautiful is that? He reaches out to those in need. The men in the last group told the landowner that they were standing idly because, why? Because no one would hire them. No one would hire them. But God said, I'll hire you. I'll hire you. Come to my vineyard. The third thing that I wanted to point out is that God is faithful to His promise. The master of the vineyard is faithful to his promise. At the end of the day, now, now, when we first read this, we don't think that it would be fair, but bear with me for a minute. At the end of the day, the master gave each man what was sufficient. Right? And the amount that he had promised to the first group, that's what he paid them, a denarius. You may say, well, this is wrong. They should have been tw paid twelve or that's wrong, that the last group of men should have been paid a twelfth. Really, should they have been paid anything at all if he didn't first go out and hire them and bring them into the vineyard? <laughs> this, is, this is our God. He, you may say, well, uh, well this is wrong. They, they, here's the point. They should have even been hired in the first place. These aren't men who have common everyday working jobs. They're just men standing out in the marketplace, men who we would probably neglect and look over. But what the master of the vineyard does is he goes and he calls them. Now, he gave them, each man, what was sufficient. Um, Christ's sacrificial death on the cross was sufficient to pay for the sins of the whole world. Man's sin can never outstrip God's grace because where sin increases, 
what abounds all the more? Grace. This is the picture of the gospel, is that God is faithful to His promise. He told the men that you'll get paid a denarius. And sometimes we're told that we're going to, we are told in Scripture, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, that we are blessed in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. But sometimes we want to act like the, like the first worker who was hired. And we want to say, oh, God, how am I going to pay this bill? And we wait for God to, to financially bless us in some way. Or we, we keep asking God for more. Like, give me more, God. I, I want more. And it's, the whole issue is, is the self-centeredness of man. But God gave them what is sufficient. I've noticed in, in my personal life and in my marriage life with Jennifer that God has always given me what I have needed. <laughs> God's given me what I've needed. Not necessarily always what I wanted. But God's always provided for me. And at times where it didn't look like God was going to provide for me, I'm sure that a lot of you can testify, He ended up coming through in the long run because God is faithful to His promise. He is. Um, the fourth thing, and, and the last thing I want to point out about the character of God, is that He gives equal grace to every person that He saves. He gives it equally, from the youngest to the oldest, from the spiritually mature to the immature adolescence of men. If you have been called and saved by the grace of God, you have gained the glory of heaven in a relationship with the Father. We have received every spiritual blessing. I was in Houston, Texas. Let's see. Three years ago, I was in Houston, Texas, working with North American Mission Board. I was working uh, in a Hispanic community center all summer long for 10 weeks. And we did diff all different types of ministry. But there was one particular day um, that was that was a very interesting day. And it was, it was a senior citizen day. And it's when all the Hispanic senior citizens, none of them knew English, by the way, but all the senior citizens would come to the community center. We would do a big lunch with them. And we would have somebody preach. And then they would receive a, a bag of food to go home with because it was, it was for the needy. We were in a lower part of Houston, Texas, where a lot of people were in, in need of food. And so I remember I was there, I was asked to preach through a translator. I've never preached through a translator before at this moment. And so let's just say I really screwed that up. <laughs> I really messed up what I was doing there. But I remember that I was preaching in Acts chapter 17 about how Paul calls the people in Athens religious in what they're doing, but not spiritually in their heart. And he begins to preach a sermon to the people in Athens. And I was preaching a sermon on that because most of the, the uh, Hispanic uh, senior citizens who were there were all have been born and raised in a Catholic church their whole life where they've been taught that you have to do these sacraments and do this stuff and do that stuff and then you'll earn your salvation. And we know by Scripture that it is by grace, not through works, that we're saved, right? So I'm preaching this message through a translator and when I'm finished, I uh, begin to walk into, into the office area where we would all kind of um, uh, get, uh, get together and kind of talk about what happened. And I remember before I'd walk back, uh, I ended with a statement and I said that you can be 60, 70, and 80 years old and still miss what it means to follow Christ. And I remember walking back off stage into this office area and here comes this Hispanic 68-year-old woman walking with a cane to the office and in the worst English I have ever heard, she said, I know have Jesus, I need Jesus. At 68 years old. And I was thinking about how, how this is God's grace that He freely bestows. It doesn't matter how old you are or how spiritually mature you are or what kind of background you come from or what race you are or what ethnicity you are or nationality or even what type of, if you're a Republican or Democrat, <laughs> I'll tell you what, it's all equally given by God because it is freely bestowed by Him in an equal, in an equal way. And this is, this is the beauty of the Gospel is that sometimes in our life we want to criticize, uh, well I'm jumping ahead myself, I'll get there. Um, so that's the fourth thing about that this scripture is teaching us about God. Um, but now I want to give two points of application and then we'll work towards a conclusion. Okay? Um, the first point of application I want to make is this. We need to be grateful for the opportunity to work for the kingdom of God. If God wanted to, He could write it in the sky that Jesus Christ is His Son 
and the Savior of the whole world. Repent and believe the gospel. He could write it. But what he chooses to do instead is use the men and the women that he has redeemed to share the gospel. Not because he needs us, but because he loves us. He has chosen to include us in this great kingdom work, this great kingdom cause. And that is a beautiful picture. We should be grateful for the opportunity to work for the kingdom of God. Before we were saved, we were at the street corner of the marketplace calling out for someone to put us to work. We had no purpose in our life. We had no, no perspective, no, no way to go. And God comes and calls us out of darkness and into marvelous light and tells us, I will put you to work. We need to be grateful for that opportunity. I'm thinking about the first man. The first man who was hired, he did not have a regular job. And so Denarius was way more than he should have got ever in the first place. He was grumbling at the end because, man, I should have received 12. You shouldn't have received anything. You didn't have a job. But the master of the vineyard was gracious enough to give you a job and to call you out of the marketplace and give you a place in his vineyard. To call you out of the kingdom of this world and, and give you a place in the kingdom of heaven. That is who this God is. So we need to be grateful for that opportunity to, to work for the kingdom of God. The central issue was the self-centeredness of the laborer. Um, he was only thinking about himself, not about the generosity and the intervention of the landowner or the fortune of other laborers. He was only thinking about himself. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, we run into the same problem. Because we think so highly of ourselves. But I think that what we need to realize is that we are all beggars in the same boat, except some of us know where the bread is at. And we get to share that with other people. But we're all beggars, we're all sinners in need of a Savior. And so we need to be grateful for what God has done for us. He is, in, in Ephesians 2, it says that we were dead, in our, we were dead, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. But God gave us life. So the second point of application I want to make is, is this. We need to learn to accept those that God has brought into His family. We need to learn to accept the people that God has brought into His family. The worker who was the first one hired was not grateful for this. He sees this other guy who's only worked an hour. Listen to his response in verse 9, or in verse 10. Sorry. Verse 11. Yeah, let's look at verse 11. It says, they received it, and the first thing they do, what do they do? They complain. They complain to the landowner. These last men put in one hour. They put in one hour, and you made them equal to us who bore the burden of the day and the burning heat. So they begin to grumble and, and complain and say, this isn't fair. This isn't right. And I was thinking and reading this and was noticing how often we do that. How often we look at other brothers and sisters in Christ and we judge them. And we're not grateful that God has called them as well. And we look at people from a different church who may have a different interpretation of the scriptures that we do. But when we get to the, the when we are face to face with God on judgment day, is God going to be more pleased with the men that He has called who believe a little differently than we do and who are truly, honestly chasing after God with all that they have? Or is He going to be pleased with the men who look at other churches and other saved people and say, wow, they've really got it wrong? We need to learn to accept those that God has brought into His family. And I think that another uh, scripture is, is Luke chapter 10, verse 2. It, it literally says the same. Jesus tells His disciples that He is sending out in Luke chapter 10, verse 2, that the harvest where they are working is plentiful. The harvest is plentiful, but, but what? The laborers are few. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And I was thinking, why are the laborers few? 
And what came to my head was that when people from outside of the church look to the church and then they see the church arguing with another church and judging that other church, then they stand out and they say, I don't want to have anything to do with the church at all. So the question is, is why do we do this? Well, coming back to the first worker who was hired, it's, it's an issue of self-centeredness that we have. Um, this is the reason that, that many people are not coming to join us in this bountiful harvest is because they look at the workers and don't want to be like the workers. But I pray that we would be workers in the vineyard who truly, 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 truly want to serve God and love Him with everything that we have. Because it is only when we do that that people outside of the harvest want to join in and work as well. And then they're going to come start standing at the marketplace saying, I want to, I want to go to work. I want to go to work. So let me bring this to a conclusion. And what is, what is the purpose of this parable? What, well, first of all, it's not about workers who are working to gain a reward. Because um, as we said a while ago, there's nothing that we can do in our own merit, our own human exertion. There's nothing that we can do in our, in our desire to make things right with God. The more that we do things, the more that we'll understand that there's nothing we can do. It's been done for us on the cross. And so the parable is not about workers who are working in the vineyard to gain that reward in the end. And it's also not about working for blessings. This parable is simply about the grace and the mercy of the loving master of the vineyard. And it's about our attitude and motivation towards others who have come to know Christ as we have. That's what this parable is about. It is not about salvation or gaining eternal life because salvation is not earned by works, nor is the parable about rewards for service because God will render each one differently according to their works. We see that in Scripture. Rather, this is a profound parable about what should be the motivation for the disciple's service. We should serve God out of gratitude, for it is only through the intervention of Jesus that any disciple receives anything. We should be concerned only to rejoice when others are called to the kingdom without serving as long or as hard as we have. The thing that I love about this parable is that it has some really specific points of application. Are you with me? It's not just a general love one another, you know, be kind, and th those are great things that are profound in Scripture but it's, it's very simple, practical points of application for us. We don't need to judge other believers. We need to edify them in Christ because we are all part of the body, and the family of God. If we, and this is the last quote that I had, is this, John MacArthur wrote this in a commentary. He said, if we think that we deserve something because of our time, diligence, and commitment of service, we have negated the real value of what we have done. All who respond to the grace of God in Jesus' kingdom invitation are equal disciples. And we must be careful not to measure our worth by what we have done or what we have sacrificed. Our calling is a calling of grace, and a grateful heart will serve without thought of reward or comparison of, to other people. As the landowner points out, to think of rewards and to compare them with others will cause us to both question the wisdom and the fairness of God and to become envious of other disciples. May we be a people, church. May we be a people who understands, the, the, first of all, the grace, the compassion, and the love of God. And then may we be people who turn and serve Him out of gratitude and not haughtiness towards other believers and not, and not living to try and, and please God by our own works because that's not what the parable is about. And may we be a people who are grateful to work for the kingdom of God and may we be a people to learn to accept those who God has brought into his family. Let us pray. Um, God, I just want to thank you so much for your words in Scripture that, that sometimes just over, just over skimming, just reading it over, sometimes it doesn't make sense. But God, as we begin to look and study and understand what you are showing us, God, our, our minds are just open to the beauty of your word. God, you are the one who is compassionate towards people. You're the one who gives salvation generously. You're the one who, who is persistent in your pursuit of man. God, you're the one who, who is faithful to your promise. 
And God, you're the one who has who gives equal grace to every person that you save. God, may we be a people who is grateful to work for you. And may we be a people who accept those who you have brought into your family. God, we love you and we thank you. And we thank you for your work. In Christ's name.